Hello again. So this is the third video lecture in week 12 of ESTEP. Our focus this lecture is on groundwater. So we are going to dive into the slides. Okay, so I want us to start out by coming to something that a lot of you, I'm sure, are very aware of, but I do want to review the water cycle. As you will have noted in this week's um, resources, I have given you some links to an awesome new water cycle produced by the U.S. Geological Survey Water Division. And it is really complex, but also they have awesome online resources. Make sure, whoops, to go and check that out. But I'm just going to quickly review this. So ultimately, all water is effectively trying to make its way to the oceans. And in the ocean, there will be evaporation from the ocean surface. That evaporated water condenses, turns into clouds, gets stored in the atmosphere, moves across land, and falls as precipitation. There are a multitude of things that can happen to that water. It can be stored as snow. It can then melt and form runoff across the landscape to feed streams. Um, what we're going to focus on is the water that infiltrates the ground. So moves down into whatever the earth materials are, and becomes groundwater. Now, that water that is stored in the earth materials, and we're going to look at how exactly it's stored, um, can supply springs. Um, it can also supply rivers, streams, and lakes. We call that it's groundwater discharge. It's when the groundwater ends up feeding surface water features. Groundwater that is stored in earth materials, well, that's effectively groundwater storage. And where it gets stored is in aquifers. So we'll be investigating that. So some of the key terms over here on the left, surface runoff, we've already discussed that when we were looking at what was feeding streams. Um, infiltration, that's the process of water making its way um, into the earth materials. And then there's groundwater discharge and groundwater storage, which we've just looked at on the diagram. So let's start with a simple definition. What is groundwater? It's water that infiltrates the ground and moves down through those earth materials until it completely fills all the open spaces until the ground is saturated with water. And here we could just say the earth materials are saturated with water. And there are really um, four terms we need to get our brain around here. Unsaturated zone, vedos zone, the water table, and the saturated zone. I'm actually going to, let me just look, no, I'm going to go to the document camera and actually draw out a diagram that's very similar to this one. So let me go to the document camera right now. And let's focus this. Okay, that's better. 
Okay, so I'm going to draw us a little cross section here. So we've got, it's Minnesota. So we're gonna call this a lake. And here we are at the land surface, the house. You're out going for a walk. There's a bit of vegetation out there. And imagine it is raining or snowing for that matter. So anyway, we've got water on the land surface. Now, what happens is that that water, let me just draw a line here, will infiltrate. And that is, it moves down into these earth materials. And it keeps moving down as a consequence of gravity until it um, reaches an area where um, all the pores are filled with water. So this line designates the water table. So up above the water table, we just have water that is moving through. The earth materials are not saturated. The spaces in between them aren't filled with water. This area in here gets called the Vados or Vados zone. It is not saturated. That's just a reminder. So water's just moving through. Everywhere below our water table is saturated. Or you could add with water. So all the pore spaces are filled. So the water table itself, well, how far is it beneath the land surface? That varies according to where one is and the time of year and how much is being removed by people. In Minnesota, it's typically somewhere between five and eight feet below the land surface. And generally, the shape of the water table mimics the shape of the land surface. What I want you to notice here is that here we've got a lake. And typically, what happens is when we have a lake, that the edge of the lake will coincide with the water table. And that means that the saturated zone here below the water table effectively feeds that lake. That would be an example of this groundwater discharge. So we could actually go around and look at lake levels and use that to map the water table level. If you go to the desert southwest, um, the water table is often 35, 50 feet and more below the land surface. The level of the water table will also depend on the earth materials and the amount of water that can be stored naturally below this water table depends, of course, on the type of earth materials that the area is made up of. So this is the diagram that's on the slide. We're going to go back to the slides now to see a beautiful, pretty version of this. So this is what we just drew. The one term I didn't use was unsaturated zone. I use the term Vados or Vados zone. And you can use either term. People will know what you mean, or hydrologists will know what you mean. Oh, for goodness sakes. There we go. So 
Um, just to stand back for a moment and think about the context, groundwater has to move through earth materials and it is stored in earth materials. So that means we are dealing with igneous rocks like on the north shore of um, Lake Superior. We're also dealing with sediment like much of the surface aquifers in Minnesota. Sedimentary rock like the um, aquifers in southeastern Minnesota and then metamorphic rock much of northern and some central Minnesota. So um, understanding the nature of these materials is very important for understanding groundwater. Now, a little heads up here. Um, I don't know if I've mentioned this before, but a lot of people use the term dirt for sediment. And this is one of my little niggling things, dirt doesn't exist, at least not as a scientific term. We either have soil or sediment. Dirt is a term that gets used in the um, gardening industry. Okay, so groundwater is water that infiltrates the ground and moves down until it completely fills all open spaces until the ground is saturated with water. So gravity plays a part here. Now, how it exactly it moves and is stored depends on the earth materials. And what this diagram is adding that we didn't have before is the concept of recharge. So we have our water table and we know that the groundwater is moving. We'll look at how we measure that a little bit later. But um, that the groundwater gets recharged. And that is just the fancy word for more, more infiltration as a consequence of precipitation. So this is a diagram you should be familiar with by now. Okay. The big question is how or where is groundwater stored? Well, we've already looked at the concept that earth materials will vary and they vary in the amount of water that they can store and in the ease with which it can be withdrawn from them. So um, many earth materials are um, effectively underground reservoirs. Um, and so when I say the word reservoir, I do not mean a lake. I'm going to repeat that, not a lake. It's just a place where groundwater can be stored. We call it groundwater because it's water that is stored in the earth materials. Um, so when this water is stored in these earth materials. We call the earth materials that they're stored in an aquifer. So, um, and I've already mentioned that an aquifer is not a lake. I'm going to say that again. It is not a lake. Now, um, the definition of what an aquifer is gets a little bit um wishy-washy in some ways. But um, here in red, if the earth materials can produce water at a rate that is useful to people, they are termed an aquifer. So this really varies uh, in terms of um, how much water is needed by people. Um, it's not a hard and fast rule. Um, now, we get into the quality of an aquifer next. So that this has to do with how much water can be stored and how easy it is to extract that water from the earth materials. So the quality of an aquifer depends on both the porosity and the permeability of the earth materials. What do these two terms, porosity 
and permeability mean? Before we move to the next slide, I want you to briefly examine the image over on the left here. Essentially, what it's showing us is, okay, we've got a series of layers. And what I want you to take away from this diagram is that there can be a series of different types of aquifers in the land beneath us. And this is where it gets really exciting. So first of all, what a porosity and permeability. Well, first of all, porosity is from the word pore or space in between particles or openings. So porosity, how much of the material has open space or voids? So in other words, this is places where water can be stored. And an excellent aquifer will have between 20 to 30 percent open spaces or voids. But one thing that's really important is those pores must be connected so the water can move in between the particles. So over here we have a diagram and what I want you to appreciate here as we move from left to right, we see um, no pore spaces on the left, some unconnected pore spaces in the middle, and then over towards the right, connected pore spaces. So that's the porosity part of it. Then we get to permeability, and this is really important. Um, permeability is a measure of how easily water passes through material. So once again, generally, it's about the being pore space and those pores being connected so that the water can move. There are a couple of interesting exceptions to this, but this, these are our essential definitions. Let's take a look at some examples here. Um, let me just move this down to here. Um, so I'm going to first just review some terminology, and then we're going to come to these diagrams here on the left. So permeable means it can transmit water somehow. It allows water to travel through it. Impermeable means the materials do not allow water to be transmitted through, through them. Now, what's interesting here is you can have material that may um, not allow water to move through it, but can itself hold water. Some examples of this would be some clays or some shales that kind of hold the water, um, but they do not easily transmit it. We've talked about pores and rocks being porous. That means they have pores, they, the water, um, sorry, the rock is permeable and allow, that allows water to travel through it. And then we have uh, rock layers or units as a whole get referred to as being either an aquifer, which means they hold water and allow water to be transmitted through them. And there's this slightly squidgy definition, they can supply enough water to be of value to users. What is an aquifer to us may, um, well, what isn't an aquifer to us may be an aquifer for someone living in or close to the Sahara, for example. Then we get to this other term that we haven't looked at yet, aquiclude. This is the term used for a geologic unit that does not transmit water and actually stops water from moving through it. In other words, it is impermeable, so an aquiclude. Now, 
Before we move on, let's look at these six diagrams that try to capture some uh, of the variation in porosity and permeability. So in example A, we're looking at a bunch of sand grains that have pore spaces in between them. And because we're not seeing it in three dimensions, we can't see how well connected the pores are, but they are. So this would be both porous and permeable, and probably about 20% plus, maybe, yeah, 20% plus porosity. Now, oh, let's go to C here, right next door to it. So here, we've got a bunch of, um, I'm going to say pebbles, that are themselves made up of sandstone, like unit A. So not only do we have pores in between the pebbles, but the pebbles themselves are porous. So this would be an incredible um, it, aquifer. It is both permeable and porous. It um, can store a lot of water. Now we're going to go down to B. So B portrays a sediment that has a bunch of particles, not unlike A, but in between the particles, there's a lot of matrix. Think back to the terminology when we were investigating sediments. So here we have a much reduced amount of pore space. And in fact, it looks as though a lot of the pores are kind of gummed up with muds and silts. So this um, may have very low porosity and be possibly somewhat impermeable or not very permeable. Next, we go on to D. And D once again, represents a whole bunch of particles. These are these white um, areas. But the spaces in between them have been completely filled with recrystallized natural cement. Sorry about that. Um, and what that does is it prevents the... Um, any water from being either stored or transmitted there. So D would be an aquiclude. <clears throat> then I'm going to look at F. <coughs> Excuse me. F next. This represents um, probably crystalline, in other words, igneous and or metamorphic rock not unlike what is up on the north shore of Lake Superior. And what you're seeing with all these sort of crisscross lines are fractures in the rock. That is the only place where groundwater can be stored. So what that means is, yes, there is some water stored in these fractures, but it's going to be much um. There's not going to be as much available, and you're going to have to just find one of those fractures. And one of the challenges in the areas in the North Shore is that a lot of that water is, um, it's, uh, there's a lot of sulfur and um, other material in it as a consequence of the rocks that um, these fractures are in. So then we go to E. This represents limestone. And what happens in limestone is absolutely fascinating because as you'll recall, limestone is made up of calcium carbonate and weakly acidic groundwater dissolves that calcium carbonate. So what happens in areas of carbonate, like southeastern Minnesota, lots of limestone, is that water penetrates the um, subsurface, everything above land surface, and it starts to dissolve the rock and make these incredible cave systems. 
And what that means is, well, number one, there's not much surface drainage because the water automatically makes its way down below the surface. There are these incredible cave channelway systems and the groundwater can move incredibly quickly. So if a gas tanker overturns in southeastern Minnesota, there is very limited time to make sure that that um, gas petroleum product doesn't make it into the groundwater system because once it gets in, it travels really quickly and there's nothing you can do about how quickly it's moving or where it's going. So this is all about uh, porosity and permeability. Now, let's move on. So next up, we're going to think about different types of aquifers. Aquifer, aquifer, you can say it however you like. Um, the quality of an aquifer depends on, obviously, the porosity and permeability of the earth materials. In other words, the rocks and sediment. And we're going to start off by thinking about um, just two types of aquifer a surface water aquifer and a perched aquifer. So think back to that very first diagram that I drew for you, where we just had um, the land surface and our water table. This is called a surface water aquifer. All this material is connected to the surface and the aquifer here, in other words, the earth materials below this main water table are connected to the land surface. So we call it a surface water aquifer. Now, surface water aquifers, look, they're um, close to the surface, but they also tend to be more susceptible to contamination. Think, for example, if there's a lot of chemicals being used on your lawn or um, in agriculture, those chemicals make it directly into this surface water aquifer. Okay, so next up, um, and this is something we see all the time in Minnesota. If the sediments near the land surface are in fact quite complicated as a consequence of glaciation. Often there are these little lenses of non or impermeable material shown in gray with dashes right here and right there. And they're left as a consequence of um, deposition by glaciers. But what happens is these areas of non-porous, um, impermeable material stop water from traveling through them. So we get these little lenses or areas of water that kind of get trapped above them. These are perched water tables. So if you have a water well in a perched water table, you have a very limited water resource that can be um, exhausted very easily. Here's one example, and then here's another. And what they've done in this diagram is also show where that perched water table actually hits the land surface. And that actually ends up in producing a line of springs all along the valley side. These are features that we do see in many locations in Minnesota. So you've just explored surface water aquifers and perched aquifers. Now, let's just review our aquifer terminology. So we've talked about surface water, Aquifers, these also get called unconfined aquifers or water table aquifers. And sorry about the phone. Um, 
I'm going to start again. Surface water aquifers, unconfined aquifers, or water table aquifers. These are terms all used for what I just described as a surface water aquifer. This is when the sediment or sedimentary rock that's at the surface and it doesn't have any impermeable material above it, overlying it. So the aquifer is directly connected to the land surface. Water can move down through that vados zone below the water table, and then we can put a well in and extract the water. Now, let's see. We get into interesting concepts now. A confined aquifer, which I'll diagram out shortly, is a situation where there are sediment or rocks that are overlain by an impermeable material. So you've got some earth materials that can both hold and transmit water, but above them or between them and the land surface, there is a layer of impermeable material. In other words, material that cannot transmit water. We've talked about perched aquifers. Then there are two other terms, confining beds. So we just mentioned a confined aquifer, the impermeable sediment or rock layers that lie on top of an aquifer blocking its connection to the surface are called confining beds. So confining beds are associated with a confined aquifer. And then we get to artesian aquifers. This is when water naturally rises to a level above the ground surface. So let's just take a look here. So this is an example from New Jersey. And I've picked this because I really like the diagram and how it communicates the um, amount of time taken to or required to replenish some of these aquifers. So here um, we have the land surface and um, the water table um, is essentially up here and um, what the uppermost or unconfined aquifer is in sandy soil. And what you'll notice is here, it takes days or years to resupply or recharge this surface water aquifer. Now, below this sandy material, there is a confining bed. So that's most likely to be a clay or a mud, for example. But below that, we have our confined aquifer. This would most likely be a sand or a sandstone. And this often takes centuries to recharge because the water that feeds this confined aquifer um, can't come through the confining bed, it has to be fed from somewhere off to the right or the left, where this layer connects to a source of water. And in this case, they've diagrammed out another confining bed and then a confined aquifer below that. And it takes millennia to, um, whoops, to feed this um, lower, I'm sorry, confined aquifer. Okay, so we've looked at those terms now. Um, a little bit about water wells. Many of you may be very familiar with water wells, but if you're, um, if you've seen um, things like this every now and then, this is what a water well typically looks like at the land surface. This is a somewhat newer one. Um, there are all sorts of rules and guidelines on the construction of water wells. Um, so basically you drill your hole and you have to line it with 
material. Down at the bottom of the well, you need to have a screen. And that's basically a kind of grating that stops sand, mud, whatever is around whatever the earth materials are from getting into the well. So the lining, that gets called the well casing. And then down at the bottom of the well, there has to be usually in most cases a pump that will basically suck up the water to where it goes into a tank. Now, there are um, very strict rules about what happens at the surface. There's in the area at the, above the well is called the well head, and there's a cap there. Um, the ground has to slope away from the wellhead. And often there's a concrete structure around the wellhead. And that's to prevent water from getting down into the well. Um, the mechanics and details of what happens once that water gets pumped up for storage are complex. And I'm sure many of you uh, have experience with managing wells. Now, finally, I want to look at artesian wells and aquifers. So first of all, I want to look at some definitions here. So the word artesian refers to situations where the water is confined under some kind of pressure below layers of relatively impermeable rock. So you've got water and you can kind of imagine that it's being, um, it's got pressure on it. So it wants to sort of escape up somehow. Um, the way, another way of thinking about it is look at this diagram on the right. I want you to, um, first of all, look at the layers. Up at the top, we have our unconfined aquifer and a water table in here. So that's something you're familiar with. Now, there's um, this longer dashed line refers to what we call the potentiometric surface. And that is the level to which water will naturally rise if it um, is effectively pressurized somehow. So what's happening here? Focus on this well right here. We've got below this unconfined aquifer, we've got some confining beds. What happens here is we've got the beds below those that confining beds are part of this artesian aquifer. So this artesian aquifer here is fed by precipitation up on the land here. And the water table for that aquifer is effectively this line right here, these longer dashes. So look at how these continue across this space. They represent the level to which the water will rise. So in this well, which goes into the artesian aquifer, the water will actually rise up to this level, up to the level of this potentiometric surface. Now, as the land surface goes down, and we drill a well over here, what happens is look at where the potentiometric surface is and where the wellhead is. This would be a flowing artesian well because the wellhead is above the potentiometric surface, right? Or it's above the water table right here. It's below sorry, the potentiometric surface. Um, so 
artesian wells and aquifers. And here I've got a text definition of an artesian aquifer, a confined aquifer that's either associated with natural springs or wells where water naturally rises to the surface because it's under pressure or it's below the potentiometric surface. This is a relatively complex concept, but particularly in southeastern Minnesota, there are quite a few artesian wells. So finally, I want us to investigate how groundwater moves. So. As I mentioned before, the water table in Minnesota is generally five to 10 feet below the land surface. Obviously that varies, but that's a general um, rule of thumb. Um, and as I've mentioned before, it essentially follows the shape of the land surface. And just like water on the surface, groundwater moves down slope within the sediment or rock within which it's stored. So still um, staying with the text here, to understand how we portray the elevation of the land surface or the water table surface, that's what it should say here, the water table surface, we draw flow lines on the contoured surface of the water table. So if you're not familiar with contour lines, this may um, not be a concept for you. But what we've got here is a simple map. This is a map I use with my students. The thick dark line represents two tributaries that join here at a confluence and then flow downstream. What I do is get my students, I tell them, oh, these contour lines are at two feet intervals. They happen to represent the surface of the water table. And I've superimposed the location of the streams on this map. And I get them to put in the elevation of the various contour lines. So that's um, just how I work this map with my students. What we're going to do is imagine that a particle of water starts at each of these dots. And we are going to show how that groundwater moves. So let's do this. I've put in the elevations associated with each contour line. I've also put in, in red, a couple of groundwater flow lines here. I didn't put arrows on the lines, but these chunky arrows show the direction of groundwater movement. Right here, we've got a the gentle top of a hill. What I want you to notice is on either side of this gentle ridge. On one side, the water is going one way. On the other side, the water is going the other way. And we can see a variety of groundwater flow directions. Now, what's really amazing is what we can do with this is we can either try and identify sources of potential pollution, or we can start to predict where we might see pollution associated with maybe a landfill or something like that. For example, if there was a landfill in the top right corner of this map, it would not be likely to pollute anywhere in the area to the west or southwest of this ridge because all the groundwater that moves under it will be moving towards the northeast and busily polluting the waters further to the northeast. So that's an example of how we use these maps. So as I mentioned, these um, groundwater flow lines 
can be used to predict contamination and identify possible point sources of pollution. A point source is one um, specific fixed activity, such as a landfill or some kind of processing plant, something like that. And here are the rules for drawing these groundwater flow lines. Okay, so next up, what about the sources of contamination? Oh, there are a multitude of these. And the diagram here is a beautiful um, rendition of many of those. The examples include leaking dumps or landfills, leaking underground storage tanks. These are huge. Think about all the little um, corner gas stations. Um, they have to check their underground storage tanks regularly. And I know that I have seen a multitude of them um, having to excavate and replace their storage tanks um, because there's been some kind of leak. That's why they always um, go in and monitor the amount of gas because they know how much they've sold. They know how much there should be in there. If it doesn't match up, then they've got a problem. Rail yards. Then there's soil erosion, fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, everything that gets spread on fields. Um, may or may not be a potential source of contamination. And then leaked or dumped chemicals. So plenty of opportunity for contamination. And I just really like this diagram. It's quite complex, but it's a great way to get students to look and try and understand the potential for contamination in three dimensions. And that's why I've added it in here. So you might want to lift this from the slides and use it. That is it for groundwater. Thank you very much. And I will see you next week. Bye.